that's been brought to its knees. It's a big issue. We'd like to know what their position is. On Australian agenda, and I just want to quote this. The rules of the game have changed. So the message is very clear. It's all about politics. This is one of the few opportunities left to keep hammering the issue. Where does the truth lie on this? I'm trying to get a straight answer. I agree with Tony Abbott. Very dangerous game to be playing as treasurer. We have a responsibility to everyone. Australian Agenda, exclusive to Sky News. Salt and demonise people on the basis of who they love. I simply do not agree. A clumsy collision with apparently no sinister intent. These VC recipients found themselves in royal company. An unmanned rocket has exploded on liftoff. Mr. Wyala Wipeout now wants to have a sensible discussion. Gets it for petrol prices to rise. It's not a new tax, it's the indexation of an old one. With no mandate from the Australian people. Delivering unrivaled live coverage. This is Scott. Sky News, Australia's news channel. Good evening, welcome to the program. There are only two weeks scheduled of parliamentary sitting this year and not much time therefore for the government to finish what's been a difficult year with as many achievements under its belt as it can. So this week it was particularly busy. It began with the Prime Minister Tony Abbott kicking off the whole process of a federation review that may include a look at the GST as well. There was a surprise hike in petrol prices, anti-terror laws were passed and more were introduced today and perhaps the biggest victory of the week for the government, its direct action plan now looks finally like becoming a reality after a deal with Clive Palmer. Joining me to look at this jam-packed week, the Small Business Minister Bruce Bilson, Janet Albertson, a columnist with the Australian newspaper, former Labor adviser Sean Kelly and the Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus. Welcome to you all. Let's start with direct action. You took it to two elections, Bruce Bilson, and uh, now you're finally going to see it become a reality. The PM gave an assurance, an absolute assurance today, that you can achieve a 5% emissions reduction by spending only $2.5 billion. Are you so sure? Yeah, in fact, I think it's more likely we'll, uh, we'll overachieve. And what gives uh, you that confidence? Well, there's a lot of appetite to have targeted investment in practical measures that produce verifiable emissions reductions. That is at the heart of the direct action policy, whether it be in uh, land degradation, remediation, whether it be in the improving the efficiency of, of energy generation, even in our own homes and in our own commercial properties, uh, soil in car uh, carbon soils, these are all worthwhile, meaningful and I think in the public interest investments that also contribute to the achievement of our targets and we're one of the developed economies in the world that are actually fulfilling our commitments. So you're confident that appetite is there to achieve all of this but the government hasn't done any modelling on this. Well, McKinsey's and others have done a lot of modelling on the, what's called the cost curve, uh, the cost involved in certain types of abatement. What we're doing is going to the market saying, give us your most cost-effective, verifiable emissions reduction initiatives. Mm. We're not expecting that the taxpayer and the government will need to completely fund those. If you and I owned a shopping centre, we might want to put in new lifts, any energy-efficient lighting, new heating and cooling. That might be a bankable investment, quite worthwhile to say 80% of the project costs. So if costs, I wanted to put in new lifts in my extra 20% where there's some support required and you'd mm. need to contest the value for money. So that's for what this money would, would be spent on, helping me get new lifts in the, in the supermarket. <laughs> using, that no, example, for a using that as an example, but if that comes through, I mean, you, you, I don't know whether you're trying to be ironic or No, 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 no just I'm just cute, trying to get a practical but that is an example. Is that is an example of practical action that delivers not only benefits for the efficiency and the productivity Because I do think the there's a great deal of confusion out there about how this works. I, I am genuinely yeah, well, trying to get a practical other examples. Example. Uh, small business, a uh, lot of refrigeration capacity. There may be an initiative uh, involving some of the distribution companies of beverages to put more energy efficient fridges in. That might be a measure that is able to be funded and is quite viable up to a point. It might need a little bit of extra help to get it over the line. Put that proposal forward, show us what the cost of abatement is per tonne, and whoever's got the most effective, efficient projects, we are ready to partner. That is the construct, yeah. that's how we're engaging the market, and that'll deliver because practical as, as you results. Know, plenty have looked at this whole idea. 
the Productivity Commission found that putting a price on carbon would be a far cheaper way of reducing emissions. Reputex, which also did some work on this, uh, says you probably only get 80 to 130 million tonnes of abatement well short of what you need to achieve 5%. Yeah, look, I mean, I've seen those reports, but I also know the great work that Greg Hunt's put in, looking and consulting and working with the appetite to achieve practical outcomes that are verifiable. We know we've got the history of the carbon tax, an extraordinary burden landing indiscriminately right across the economy, hurt and harm regardless of your capacity to change and adapt your practices, your energy consumption, your emissions profile. This is the opposite. This is saying target that help where outcomes can be achieved at the most cost-effective most cost effective way. That's what the strategy is. I'm more than confident that we'll not only meet our targets, we'll well exceed them and, and set a fine example to other developed economies right. to make commitments and then actually deliver them. That's a piece that's missing in this discussion as well. Uh, Janet, is it worth a try? You know, I always get nervous when governments overpromise, and I think the Abbott government should perhaps not overpromise here. Uh, I'm not sure there's, there's much evidence at all, Bruce, to suggest that you will meet your targets. Um, quite the opposite. And my concern with direct action is that A, we don't know enough about how it will work. B, it is about governments picking winners, and governments don't have a great track record of picking winners. Uh, the third problem I see with it is we don't yet know, because there are so many unknowns around it about the regulatory issues arising from it. For example, the compliance costs for business in being part of the Renewable Energy Fund. Um, you know, this is why a lot, a lot of people in business are saying, well, give us access to international credits because you've immediately hived off all the compliance costs associated with being part of the Renewable Energy Fund. There are lots of question marks around it. And just from looking at the last seven years of government, don't overpromise. Mm. No, well, look, let's be clear. This isn't the Renewable Energy Fund. This is the Direct Action Fund. Uh, we're no, not, we're not, Sorry, not, not the Renewable. No, no, no. We're, not, we're not picking winners. No, no, no. We're inviting those with the capacity to deliver cost-effective, verifiable abatements to come forward. What do you mean so we're not, we're not picking on, on. They are not providing their winners? own. They're, they are putting forward get, their best case. You get, Let me finish. No, no, they you, are you get 10 or 20 people case. coming saying, we want to put in a new lift, and you're picking a winner. No, no, they're coming forward with, here's our proposition. Here's the cost of a tonne of abatement. Yeah. Compare that to other propositions brought forward by those who feel they are best placed to deliver cost-effective, verifiable abatements. That is what will get so us to our... Does the company have to come to you with um, this is actually what it's going to cost to... Yeah, uh, so what, they have to do all that work the, the themselves. Paper, the the on, discussion on what, what paper will... and the program parameters have been out there. Uh, we've talked about how you would engage the land use sector, uh, what you do to change land management in the savannah and places where a different practice can have a very different outcome in emissions, what you do if you're in the built environment, how you could possibly partner with others to aggregate your proposal. A whole range of possibilities. We are engaging in the appetite and the ability of the Australian economy and the Australian community to bring forward their best ideas for cost-effective, verifiable abatement rather than hitting the whole economy in every household with a carbon tax that's added so little to that goal. Mark Dreyfus, is this a more targeted way of reducing emissions in a lighter touch? It's a completely dud scheme. We've been sitting here listening to Bruce trying to explain it for five minutes. Uh, I've been waiting for four years for an explanation for this scheme when, since it was first released in February 2010. The Liberal Party has never explained it. We had a little burst of the lies they told about the pr carbon price that Tony Abbott got elected on. Bruce likes to repeat them. They don't tell us anything about this scheme. It is two and a half billion dollars <coughs> of taxpayers' funds being thrown at big polluters. It's a slush fund for big polluters. It is picking winners, of course it is. We're told that these uh, various companies, Bruce liked to talk about the, say, um, businesses that are going to do energy efficient uh, improvements to their businesses, apparently they're going to be in the, in the hunt. Uh, and so will a host of others, including, I'm sad to say, all of those small businesses in Australia that have embarked on projects under the Carbon Farming Initiative, which was a part of the Clean Energy Future Plan. Uh, I can recall very directly uh, Greg Hunt standing at the dispatch box in 2011 in opposition promising me as I was introducing this legislation that the Carbon Farming Initiative scheme was fully supported by this government. It is going to be in a complete wrecked state once this direct action slush fund so? comes in because the way it worked was to approve <coughs> different methodologies so that farmers 
and businesses, um, landfills to take an example, piggeries, could take advantage of a particular methodology to generate carbon credits which they were selling into a, an emissions trading scheme, a market scheme. And now they can't. The scheme's gone. Well, no, that's not right. Not only is the that scheme... That opportunity remains. Not they'll be rewarded in a different way. <laughs> so how, how, what can they'll they They'll have do? to compete. I'm going to answer... The, Bruce won't answer the question, so I'll try well, and answer... Do a, let's they'll do us do us a favour. They'll compete. If you disagree with something, just say you disagree. No, no, well, no, tell me not, how... Not, tell me how a lie. Just say you disagree. That's a more Tell me how all the small businesses... What if it is a lie? How all the small businesses currently operating under the Carbon Farming Initiative are going to get money out of your slush fund. Because they can bring forward those proposals and compete. that you've said and are so meritorious. So no guarantee. Oh, so you're just happy to have the money go wherever. This is like the $30 billion that Labor put into the economy to some of what you describe you've as the most the polluting you've industry. Point. No, no. The it way might the not be convenient for, me, for no. me to contest your point. Okay, let me but you put let a me lot of money in into the economy. It's a, it's a, the a dud scheme, okay, okay, David. Okay, 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 just, just, just before we move off this point. So you've got 10 uh, piggeries, to take that example at the moment they're able to sell those carbon credits into a market. What happens to those 10 piggeries now? Well, Not all of them will be able to Under the discussions benefit. that the government's had with the cross benches, the Carbon Farming Initiative is carried forward. In fact, that is the enabling legislation within which a broader range of opportunities has been attached. Okay, what happens so to those, Mark's what happens those 10 businesses? What well, happens there's still an opportunity to participate know, in the opportunity program. And they're key. carrying forward and the length but and longevity of those projects. What I'm, what I'm asking projects. is, will all 10 still be the same or will some be worse well, off? Where you've got them already engaged in that process, the discussion has been about continuing those and new opportunities for a broad range of abatements. So no guarantee? Well, you're talking about existing yes. commitments? Or exi well, the existing commitments can carry forward and the time frame for the payback under the discussions we've had with the crossbenchers has been extended. Nick Xenophon was keen to see a longer, a longer window for those investments so that more substantial projects could be brought forward. So, no so one's you going to carry be worse forward, off. none of them are going to be There's a broader range of opportunities for people no, to engage. Every single farm and every single business if that's participating current, in the let scheme. Let me the question that is currently earning carbon credits under the Carbon Farming Initiative, they are going to continue to receive money from your fund? If they are participating no, no, if, in the... No, no, are they going no, to continue you, to receive you money? You can... Uh, well, the detail of how they receive the money right now compared to how they'll receive the money if they are a current program or an ongoing or a new applicant for the program, that detail I don't have with me. So no but guarantees? The machine, no well, guarantees. Well, no, hang on, don't get overexcited. The well, point at, is at the, moment, the carbon farming measures that were permissible under the legislation that is the framework where our direct action plan has been enacted, they are being carried forward. You're asking me about some specific case studies. I don't have those specific case studies, but the carbon farming opportunities continue along with a broader range of emission abatement opportunities. So that is why I am confident and the government is confident we can meet the target. Sure. Uh, no let, me, let me bring in Sean. I'm, no I'm, I'm, I'm glad this is such a simple area to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Debate for everyone, and I'm sure the audience are following intricately every uh, detail. Um, just in that communicating um, sense yeah. of this thing, do you think it's going to be easier or harder for this government than it was for the previous government to try and sell an unpopular carbon tax? I don't think this government needs a climate policy uh, in particular. I don't think anybody out there in the community voted for Tony Abbott because they believed that he was going to act on climate change. I don't think many people in the community believe that Tony Abbott believes in climate change. I don't think that anybody out there in the community is going to vote for this government at the next election because they've taken effective action on climate change. This is a fig leaf. That is all it has ever been. So the communication task, frankly, Greg Hunt ain't going to have a lot to do for the next couple of years. <laughs> it, it, well, by, by the sounds of it, he's going to get a lot of uh, questions in the parliament, though, going to the detail uh, from Labor on this. One thing the government has conceded in getting Clive Palmer over the line was to have a review into an emissions trading scheme, or at least what's happening around the world with emissions trading schemes. Um, is the government seriously going to think about that, or is this just a review to get Clive Palmer over well, the line? That was what was sought in the negotiations, and that's what's been accommodated. Except Our positions... The, <laughs> the government's on, ruled just, out just, an emissions we, trading I'm scale. sorry for that's interrupting your interruption. Sorry. but um, what, What's the, the point of the review? Well, that was what was asked. Clive was keen to have that examination carried out, uh, to have the, the, the climate agency carry it out. Uh, we've agreed to that and to provide the resources to carry it out. But our position is absolutely clear. We are not in favour of ETSs. That is not our policy position. That is not something we have an appetite for. That's been absolutely clear and made 
crystal clear again in the parliament today, crystal clear to the crossbenchers, but that's something that in the discussions to get another important part of our package through the parliament, we were happy to concede to that request. Do you think that's much for the government to give away? Or do you think it's just a... Oh, I think it's completely irrelevant. Um, it's given, you know, Clive Palmer the chance to, uh, you know, to, to pursue his one great policy, and that is uh, Clive Palmer, you know, self-promoter. Mm. Um, so I think, I think you had to. It's silly. I mean, what, what are you doing? You're giving the, the second lease of life to the Climate Change Authority to, to consider something that we know w where the outcome will be. We know what they're going to say to tell the government to do something that the government won't do. The whole thing is completely ridiculous. But it's not about that. That was just about... Clive being able to get up on the podium. I mean, a lot of us, I think, miss the whole point of Clive Palmer. He came to Canberra with one really important policy. One, only one, and important, important to him, and that is self-promotion. That's the only reason, that's, only, that's the only way that you can go from standing next to Al Gore three months ago to then standing next to Greg Hunt uh, yesterday. It's all about self-promotion and a lot of journalists we talk about, oh gosh, he's so inconsistent, he's, uh, he's hypocritical, he's mercurial. The more we do that, the more, yeah. the more publicity he gets. He doesn't care. He d doesn't matter where he sits on everything. As long as he's being talked So about. long as he's in front of the camera. Do you, what do you think, Mark Ravis, of, of Clive Palmer's idea, just to talk about him for one more minute, um, of this dormant <laughs> ETS. Surrender. <laughs> yes, that's right. Of the dormant ETS that kicks in when uh, other um, trading partners do. This isn't a dormant ETS. ETS no, under no, the no, other no, no, I'm asking you about, ETS I know, I'm asking you about Clive Palmer's idea, though. If, if, if he got his way, would that be a, a good option? Uh, we can already see that we, we should go to an ETS now. That's what, as Janet says, we know what the Climate Change Authority are going to come up with because the least cost, most efficient means of reducing emissions is an emissions trading scheme. That's why California's adopted it. That's why the Chinese are taking on in a number of provinces our scheme, as it happens. That's why Korea's moving to an emission, emissions trading scheme. Europe's already got one. And that's the direction the world's going in. It, I find it disgraceful what this government's done to our climate change policy. We're heading into a large conference in Paris at the end of next year. There's a kind of interim conference in Lima at the end of um, 2014. And Australia will go with no means to meet any increased emissions targets and in fact no means to even meet the target that the government says it's signed up for. If we did have an emissions trading scheme though, what should it be linked to? Uh, we had announced already that we would link to the European scheme uh, because it's the most fully functional scheme presently in the world and it's got coverage pretty similar to the scheme that has now been dismantled uh, that we had in Australia that was working to, re to bring down emissions. Uh, it, it's, uh, as Sean said, this, this government doesn't need a climate policy because no one thinks they're in the least bit interested in climate change and I feel deeply sorry for Greg Hunt that he happens to be the Minister for the Environment in a the, government that doesn't want to do anything. Point, Mark, did you take that policy to the last election? The emissions trading scheme? Yes. Absolutely. And what did voters say? Well, they voted for a whole range of reasons. Well, you know, I don't think there's much appetite out there for an ETS. I it think was a pretty central well, we'll, we'll issue. It was we'll a very see. central issue. Well, I, think, I, think, I, think uh, I don't think that's true, David. I'm sorry. The carbon I, I think, tax. I think that anybody that thinks the last election was decided on the basis of the carbon tax or any policy, to be honest, is kidding themselves. The last election was decided on three ridiculous years of Labor division. That was the one factor that drove voters. I think voters. you underestimate voters. I think you underestimate yeah. voters about a number of in, in, You don't think Labor had any policy uh, problems? Carbon tax was I, I think you underestimate issue. voters if you think that the carbon tax was the deciding issue at the last election. I'm not saying it was deciding. I'm saying it was one of the important issues, um, policy issues that voters uh, so you, you, thought about when they went into that. You don't think carbon tax votes or budget management were on the minds oh, of voters? I think they had a, a huge impact in the lead-up. I think it allowed Tony Abbott to do an enormous amount of damage to Labor. Uh, I'm not saying they weren't a political issue in the previous few years. That would be idiotic. But by the time the actual poll occurred in 2013, it was about Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard and very little else. Gee, that's I, I don't think you know, well. until the party, until the Labor Party recognises some of the policy errors, you know, you guys are going nowhere. And well, Jan, I'm, I'm happy to talk about mandates in the last to, election. Where, where, perhaps one of the upsides of yep. the inquiry would be to deal with what Mark said. Well, I, I want to get European back to that. scheme was comparable to the one you'd implemented in, in Australia. Of coverage. What, well, there was, it was one dollar per head per European is the scheme. Four hundred dollars per head was what you inflicted well, on Australia. That so that's let's, another, that might another be, untruthful. That number might be an opportunity. But see, again, mm. you might you might just disagree, Mark. The problem. Okay. The problem no, I'm is going to say untruthful. Mark Dreyfus, on this, on well, this serious matter Profoundly here. misguided. No, no. If you had an ETS, if you had an ETS that's that's tied to Europe. Uh, and I don't know what the European price is today, but um, it would be what, around the five or six dollars a tonne.
Yeah, don't quote me, but it's in it'd that be range. In that, range yeah. right? that is still um, probably five times or more what uh, the Chinese have, and certainly um, many times more than that, uh, a lot of other Asian competitors that steel makers, aluminium makers, uh, copper smelters in Australia are having to compete against, aren't they? Doesn't that put them at a disadvantage? And, and that's why we had emissions intensive trade exposed industries given uh, at the start of the scheme in, the, in grade one, 93 per cent free permits. And in the grade in the second um, tier, 66 per cent free, free permits. So you'd want to do all of that sort of scheme again? To that oh, 30 billion oh, I'm not, going, I'm not saying again. exactly. You know, an emissions now, trading but... scheme is what we are committed to, exactly what yep. the design of it looks like will depend on when it can be introduced, what's operating elsewhere in the world, what linkages are available, and you have to tailor what you introduce to what's going on in the world. So um, you're but critical of us what's... investing $2 billion, but you're happy to put $30 billion in That's to another, soften the land. That's another nonsense well, figure. Well, it was well canvassed and in the Parliament today, and there was we, We've no had from Tony Abbott this week that he wants to have a mature debate, well, which is a joke coming from table. him, but Bruce is not wanting to participate Bruce, in a mature debate. Bruce, well, I, get was... the, I, get the, I get that you disagree with an emissions trading scheme, but, if, but, but it, once the emissions trading scheme was going ahead, are you really saying that you were against structural adjustment for those industries affected? You, were, you were against structural adjustment. I'm drawing very attention to... Bruce, what Labor's saying, being critical of You're what we're doing. You're very determined not to answer any actual for, questions no, tonight. I'm happy to, but just because it's inconvenient question, for the Labor line, the I'm, that's not something that troubles me. If it's inconvenient for you and the Labor line to point out that you're critical of a little over $2 billion going in as an incentive to bring about verifiable outcomes versus the $30 billion equivalent There's a put great on the deal table of to soften the landing of your not, carbon tax, that is a is spectacular not, piece of the hypocrisy. Amount, so the criticism is what it is being spent on it, and the way Outcomes. in which it is being <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a great deal of difference in which it's being out spent. For spending $30 billion from revenue you are collecting versus $2.5 billion straight out of taxpayers' pockets is a significant difference, and that is what your policy so when you're does. you're taking $8 billion out of the economy, you, won't, you don't see that as relevant. We do, because that's cost to households, that's input cost increases for business, that da damages our We're going to have to act on climate you change, put money Bruce. on the table to soften the you landing and the pain the of your world. old scheme. You are going to hurt the economy significantly. Before we leave this whole fresh. issue, let me just, uh, and picking, back, uh, picking up on something that Janet said at the start, international credits, um, carbon permits, they're cheaper, they're... Many would say the most cost-effective way of um, bringing down emissions. Why isn't the government? Why has the government ruled that out? Well, we've said in our election policy that we've taken to two elections. Our focus is on domestic action for verifiable outcomes. You said a lot of That's things at the election, though. You said you'd get rid of the <laughs> climate change authority. This, this is about every This other is not, not an unfamiliar but discussion because this was a contested topic. In the, two, in the previous election, the most recent election, our position is clear on our preference to make that investment in our country to not only achieve our outcomes but also enhance the productivity of our economy. We think we can achieve both of those things and that's why our do, focus do you accept, is on that though, domestic investment. Do you accept investment. though that um, uh, reducing emissions anywhere in the world is going to have the same effect as reducing emissions here? Well, that's, that's, and we've gone through the argument about what's verifiable, what the bankability is and fungibility of those permits. We've had that conversation. Well, what, what's the answer to our, that? Then? Our answer is we will focus on doing if you what verify, needs to be done in our country, in our but country But I'm just to trying to explore why that is and why this blanket refusal to reduce a verified tonne of emissions in America, in Europe, in, in another country, and not here. Look, I know there's a lot of people wanting to, to say it's a good hedge, but we've been clear on our policy position. And why is that? Well, because we want to to. practical action here that both advances our, our attainment of the emissions reduction goal, but also does domestic benefit in a range of industries that participate. Even though it's going to cost quite it's a bit more. It's been the policy design because we want the action to be done here. So taxpayers are going to have to wear that. We want the action here. All right, let's move on. We'll take a break. Uh, and then we'll turn to something that's, I'm sure, going to have uh, far more agreement than, uh, than any of this. The GST. Small business. The GST. Oh. It <laughs> does affect business. small business. <laughs> Don't worry. Small business care a lot about this one. Stay with us. <laughs> Susan and Trevor, real, everyday Apia customers. Do you find it odd that Apia rewards customers who drive less than 20,000 kilometres a year because they think they're a better bet? Odd? It's not odd at all. With Apia's drive less, pay less discount, Apia customers saved on average 22% on their comprehensive car insurance. If you're over 50, call Apia for a chat today and find out how they reward your experience. Trev, Trev! Conscience! <sighs> 
conscience. Where have you been all day? Why? What happened? <laughs> In your face! <laughs> oh, Jay. New shapes light and crispy with 75% less saturated fat. Even your conscience will love them. Okay, yeah. Australia's got energy. Natural gas can help Australia in a lot of ways. How can we turn it into something even more? Chevron's built a global technology centre here in Perth. With the right technology and research partners. The next energy breakthroughs will happen right here. Our engineers and scientists can be the new energy leaders. Australians are becoming the new global energy leaders. When you buy a home, the last thing you want is to be hemmed in by your home loan. That's why we have flexible home loans. They can change when things, well, change. Home loans with room to move? Come back, Ken. What are they doing, Grandpa? They're in retirement. People did it when I was a boy. What did they do in retirement? Whatever they wanted. Talk to MLC or one of our advisors about how we can work together to save your retirement. The physicality of Super Rugby, you know, the strain on the bodies, you know, the immense amount of work that goes into keeping these athletes on the field is crucial. We collect 140 data points on each player every day. We thought a large majority of injuries just happen. Now we know we can prevent them and predict them. Start the week with a different viewpoint. Join me as we look at the crucial national issues from outside Canberra's politically correct part. There will be big interviews, lively debate. You say it's a contradiction, Chris. I don't accept that it is. Join me for Viewpoint on Sky News. Good to have your company tonight. We're going to move on to, well, small business, kind of. Um, what does small business minister think about the GST? What sort of feedback do you get? Well, we, we get feedback that it's sometimes too complicated to report on. Uh, understood to be part because of, the of all the exemptions as well. Well, the, the feedback is depending on how your systems are, are geared up, and a lot of software companies now have an interactivity between your reporting for GST and your bank account. So there's been some automation there, but but still something that's grudge business. No one gets that excited about having uh, to do it, and uh, that's why we're looking as part of our red tape reduction measure to see what can be done to streamline that administrative process so small businesses can get back to their business rather than doing the government's business. How do you think a small business would feel about any increase or change to the GST? Well, they have every opportunity to express that view, you know, with the tax white paper and the federation white paper we want to engage all sections of the community to have that conversation about what revenue structure do we think we need to fund the essential works and services and some clarity about which level of government is carrying the ball for what services so there's strength and accountability so everyone will have that opportunity and uh, I know small business people well their voice will be heard and uh, I'll make sure it's very much a part of the deliberations. All right Sean we spoke about on the climate change issue, the, the role of experts here and economists who are uh, you know, fairly universal in their condemnation of direct action. They're also fairly universal in saying the GST is something that we can't leave it where it is at uh, 10% forever. Well, I, I believe I've said on this show before, David, that it's almost inevitable that we're going to have to look at changing the GST yeah. at some point. There is a revenue problem in this country and moving into the future, uh, largely because there are hugely increasing expenditures at the, in the area of health and ageing, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot we can do to bring them under and control. No, no one wants to lose any of those services. In of fact, we not. want more. We want the NDIS. We want everything we can. And, and aged care, you mentioned as well, and, and how do we pay for it? We're not at the moment, are we? Uh, we're absolutely not, no. Um, so we are going to have to look at, uh, at other sources of revenue, and I think that at some point this government is going to have to be very honest with people about that.
Mark Dreyfus. Well, that'd be a first if this government was honest. It would. Um, we've got a, a Prime Minister who promised 33 times before the last election, 13 times since the last election, that there wouldn't be any change to the GST. So he's got a bit of explaining to do well, because at okay. the start of this week we see the Prime Minister uh, floating the idea that there's going to be an increase in the GST, uh, calling amazingly from him for a mature debate. Uh, given the way in which he behaved right through to the last election. And uh, I'd like to know what his plans actually are. He certainly won't rule out an okay, increase to the is, GST. Okay, I, I get the point that he said that before the election, but surely at some point we can have a debate about our tax and federation systems, right? And, and, and for the future, not for this term of parliament, but for the future. Can we have that debate? And is Labor willing to have that debate? Of course. Uh, we're not like the Liberal Party, which refused to attend the tax summit uh, at the but start of every Kevin time, Rudd's prime ministership. Every time this issue comes up, you say, but you said, mm. you said before the election, you said 33 uh, times. We need a bit of honest talk. That'll be a first from Tony Abbott about this topic and a few other topics. And one of the first things he has to engage in is why he told the Australian people so many times before the election and after the okay, election. But can you move that on from that then and, and get into... there's been no change to GST. Well, OK, let's, let's, let's pretend about? there's a can blank page. Of, of what people said before the election and what we need to do for the future. Do you accept the GST has to be looked at? I think that taxation long term um, will have to be looked at, uh, but I don't think that we've got the right approach from this government. He's, trying to, he's announced cuts of $80 billion to health and education in an attempt, it would seem, to blackmail the states into calling for a change to GST. Mm. Uh, but do that's you, do not you the right think way the GST needs it. to be looked at as, as part of this tax debate? No, we don't think that the GST is the right way to go. We think that it is a regressive tax that unfairly or inequitably uh, affects poorer people in this country. And we think there's many other things that you could do, including some of the revenue measures that this government has got rid of, like uh, a tax on the 15,000 or so largest self-managed super funds in this country, uh, which was in our last budget, and this government's got rid of as soon as it came to power. But if you did... That's $2 billion. If, if you did increase uh, the GST by to 12.5% or, or thereabouts, you could make changes in the income tax scales to, to keep the progressive nature of the tax system there. Well, I'm all in favour of a progressive tax system and I think it's important that we keep one of the great features of the Australian taxation system has been uh, not only that we have progressive taxation, but we also have means testing of benefits. Uh, we've got a very, very targeted welfare system which fits together with a progressive taxation system. What about the exemptions that are there, like fresh food, as, as, as many have pointed out? Um, I mean, who buys Wagyu steak and truffles and fresh barramundi? All those fresh foods that don't attract any GST, uh, and yet any processed food which are predominantly purchased by lower socio so, um, uh, income earners, they do, they do have to pay GST. Uh, a change to the GST on food, widening uh, the net for GST, would be one of the most regressive things you could do. And the thought that there might be GST on education, which is another idea that seems to have been floated by the government recently, uh, similarly. Even though the rich pay private school fees well, and the poor don't. It's for the, it's, it's for the government to first of all explain why they said so many times no change to the GST. I'm just trying and to put no, forward the government said that. I'm just trying to explore. Just a bit of clarity would be good. Why, why it would be um, regressive to extend the GST to fresh food? Uh, because food, a bit like energy, occupies a larger part of the household budgets of poorer people in this country. And that's why you get regressive effect from extending the GST to, to all food. I think you need to look at Tony Abbott's motivations as well here, David. I think if Tony Abbott were using the extra funds from an increased GST and a wider net for the GST to put into health and education, for example, public health and education, which were used by people at the lower end of the socio-economic uh, scale, you could potentially make a case and you could make a structural case. But it seems much more likely at this point that Tony Abbott will do a couple of things. Firstly, significantly cut the amount of money going to health and education Education, as he's already done to the tune of $80 billion, and secondly, use the, some of the extra money he gets from the wider take of the GST to go towards income tax cuts to bribe voters before the next election. That will be the playbook. Neither of those things is remotely progressive. All right, Janet, um, how do you see the progressive nature or regressive nature of the GST, and should it be increased? 
I think, uh, as Sean said, it's inevitable that it will have to be increased. New Zealand has increased it. Four years ago, they increased it to 15%. And at the same time, they brought down their top marginal tax rate. You know, if we as a country can't look at serious tax reform, uh, then you have to really worry about the future of this country. And, and, and for serious economic reform to happen, if you look at the history, you have to have an opposition. You have to have an opposition leader that has, A, the conviction towards economic um, reform and secondly the courage that as, a, as an opposition leader you can agree to something in relation to economic reform without just saying no, no, no. Now the, if you look back on history you know the, the, it, it's a scarce resource isn't it bipartisanship on economic reform. How it did it in relation to the really big issues since then we've not seen a lot of that bipartisanship on really big economic reforms and until we get that it's a bit like a referendum we won't see any serious economic reform in this country which is a great shame and I don't think we can yet say Sean what Tony Abbott is planning to do uh, because a he hasn't well, decided sure, okay yeah yeah but I think they're farcical because you know for example really? you're yes you're talking will, about I'll, you're talking about you're years. talking about an 80, uh, 80 billion dollar cut to health and education that money wasn't there that's a pretty easy cut to make because the money wasn't there so the states of course that's are ridiculous. Argument, a cry, well, can I finish? The, the, the states, of course, will always cry for more money, but until the states start becoming more efficient and more responsible with the way they spend money, you know, talking about just increasing the GST is a tiny part of the picture. It has to be about putting responsibility back onto the states, and this is where the issue about federalism is critical. We need to get issues like health and education back at the grassroots level back to the state so they become responsible for the revenue and for the spending. So Bruce Bilson, do you think the GST should be increased? Well we have no proposal because we want to start the discussion. I know that. But and, and, and that's, I mean, let, let's, let's deal with what is happening. What is happening is there's a general view that we need to examine the revenue raising mechanisms. What is it, six or seven taxes raise 92% of all the revenue at all levels of government and there's another hundred shrapnel taxes that pick up the rest. Um, Mark's team in office modelled an increase on the GST. No one knows what that says because it's in a locked box somewhere. No one can see it. There's a conversation that needs to be had to, to tease out what is in the longer term interests of the nation. Now, I'm not going to preempt those discussions. We want to engage the public in them. The Prime Minister is engaging the business community. We're seeking to engage the opposition and anyone who's got some contribution to make to this longer term interest for all of us and, and the intersection, as Janet's touched on, with the Federation. Now, the GST, the revenue goes to the states and territories. Nothing will happen unless all the states and territories agree. We have no proposition to raise, the shift, change the GST. That's all facts now, but the conversation is needed about what's necessary for the longer term interests of our country. You do uh, obviously um, want to increase petrol tax. You did that this week, or it kicks in on uh, November 10 in a couple of weeks. Um, you didn't say you'd do that before the election, though, did you? Well, we've reintroduced indexation of, of petrol taxes, something that the Hawke government had, something that the Howard government was able to freeze because we could afford to do so. We need to repair the budget. You know, we've got the debt and deficit trajectory. We need to arrest and then start turning around. But we also need to get on with building the productive capacity of the country. And that's where that indexation of fuel taxes will go into road construction, crucial infrastructure to carry commerce and commuters. That's part of our strategy, while the overall tax take is down $5.7 billion. So simpler, fairer taxes. We're achieving that with an overall reduction in the tax take and reintroducing indexation to maintain the real value of those fuel tax revenues. We all see uh, the Bowser price bump up and down throughout the week from Tuesday to Friday to Sunday. Um, do you think people are going to notice a half a cent a litre? Uh, certainly that's what I hear from people in my electorate and I will answer your question to Bruce since he wasn't prepared to. Your question to Bruce was you didn't say anything about that before the last election and his answer should have been no because this government said nothing at all about raising the price of petrol before the last election. What they did say was no new taxes, no increases in taxes, and this is what they do in office. It's very important that they be held to account for that. That's why we're opposed to it, um, and we don't think it's the right thing to do. Again, it's regressive, and Bruce should be concerned as small business minister about the effect on the five million small businesses in this country of steadily increasing the Commonwealth take 
on fuel. What what will it mean for small well, I'm very alert to the impact. That's why fuel tax credits are there. So for off-road and heavy transport use, there's no net impact. For those businesses that are using expenses of business input, it's expensable. For those businesses wanting to get on with their business, they need to be able to move around our road network. This is where we've got the budget repair task having to be pursued, and it is, whilst we build well, just the productive on, capacity on, of is our economy. Is it a budget repair be both. task or no, no, is it going into it's road? It's either no. for roads or it's budget repair, but no, no, I'm not saying both. this is solely the that. Prime Minister got There's more on going on than whatever you're talking, <laughs> so where is talking about. Where so is the, the budget where is repair the task goes on across the board, and we've had a long discussion about rates of increase, the growth yeah. rates of certain expenditures that Mark likes to so characterise as a cut. This is going back into roads. All of it? Yep. 2.2 billion? Yep. So nothing to do with repair of the budget. No, no, it's, no, no. It's Let me be clear. Going I'm, to go to roads. I'm, I'm maybe not explaining myself very well, or maybe there's not a receptive audience to what I'm saying, Mark. But government doesn't just do one thing. We have a range of commitments to the electorate: abolish the carbon tax, stop the boats, repair the budget, and, and end the hemorrhaging and the debt that we're pushing on to next generations. Oh, and to stop build no one the infrastructure this for the anymore. future. So we're doing well, Mark, those Francis, things. Isn't, and in, isn't a half a cent uh, rise in fuel? Excise, uh, nothing and, compared and, to what the carbon and, tax did to the same and, people you're and worried about. And continuing to rise, and continuing to rise. But the carbon tax was going to do that as well. Uh, nine in ten Australian households received assistance that fully dealt with the cost to their household budgets of the carbon price. But isn't the, the whole point, isn't the whole point of putting up uh, the price of either electricity or a fossil fuel like petrol to change behaviour, and therefore isn't this something you should welcome? I think Tony Abbott in, when in Washington described fuel taxes as a carbon tax, uh, so we've got perhaps that's a question that Bruce might like to answer more. Um, I don't think anyone here in the government is suggesting that this increase in fuel tax is, is in some way going to assist with emissions reduction, far from it. But doesn't it, doesn't it, it just going to the logic of having any sort of price on carbon, um, it, it, it is meant to change behaviour, isn't it? And I know half a cent isn't going to, but as you point out, it's, it's over time, it's going to build, uh, it's going to go up every six months. It, doesn't that fit with the logic of, of pricing these things? No, oh, potentially, yes, but we want an economy-wide uh, carbon price, or at least as near as we can get to an economy-wide pro carbon price. Agriculture wasn't included in our scheme. Yeah. Um, but that's the least cost, most efficient way of reducing emissions, and that's what this government has abandoned. <laughs> Sean, do you think in the, in the name of fiscal responsibility, hmm. Labor should be supporting this? Yeah. Well, not if Bruce's <coughs> answer to the question of is all this money going to roads, yes. <laughs> I mean, either it's all going to roads or it's going yeah. to budget if repair. It was all it's going not to a talking point, Bruce, it's a fact. No, no, I'm just trying to share a simple <laughs> fact that if Labor leaves the government with a budget does that has things, no yes, money left, then we can't fund infrastructure That's when not there's an no money the question, left. Bruce. So that in relation to the fuel indexation reactivation, that money is going into infrastructure because there's not money left. This is Labor's the problem. This is the spend all the money and then some. So that's the issue. You're putting this money into roads, you're putting a GP co-payment should it get through into a medical research fund. You're not actually well, paying, down, you're not have actually to paying do, down deficits. There's contemporary things that need to be pursued at the same time. That's, that's what, what governments do. the whole message about why you're inflicting the pain in the budget. Well, though, isn't, isn't it, the, the it sad that we've reached the position where we as an electorate can't be happy with money going to budget repair? It tells you how difficult economic reform in this country is, that you have to you know, tart it up with a medical research fund, that you've got to tart it up with road funding. I mean, of course, road funding, we understand money has to go there, but yeah. the medical research fund, you know, build that. Um, it's just ridiculous. So it's yeah. just an indication of where we're at in relation it, to it economic reform. It mixes the message. You've got, to, you've got to acknowledge that. When you're saying budget crisis... We're getting crisis on with many things concurrently. Many things. OK. But on Labor, if the money was going to pay down the deficit, do you think they should be supporting... Oh, look, the problem with the petrol tax is, is twofold. Firstly, it's regressive. It's regressive in its form. The, the bottom fifth of households, it takes 6% of their disposable income. For the richest fifth of households, it takes 2% of their disposable income. So, much like the GST, it is a regressive tax, as Joe Hockey learned to his great cost and embarrassment. Um, the other problem is you can never look at any policy in isolation. You have to look at it in the context of the suite of government policies. And unfortunately, uh, while I believe John Howard should have kept the indexation in place, there's no... 
I think, look, it would have given us an extra $5 billion a year by now. That is a huge amount of money. He gave it as an electoral bribe to voters. It was a fiscal mistake. Uh, we're at this point, uh, and the problem with introducing it now is that it comes in the context of a budget which is full of cruel measures that hit poor people much, much harder than they hit rich people. It's 40 and fact, cents a week. It's and 40 fact, cents a week, Sean. It is, it is 6% of disposable income. It's 40 cents a week of disposable 50 litres of petrol. Well, Jenna, I think you you're know out what? of touch. I, I'm <clears> out of touch 40 cents a week. You, I, you I think, think you're out of touch. If you think, can, if can you think those costs don't add up, week. not in combination with a GP hike, with cuts to benefits, and that's my point, in combination with all of the budget measures, there's a hugely punitive budget for poor people. So and yes, anybody who backs this budget is completely out of touch, Bruce. So you're on board with abolishing the carbon tax. $550. No, Bruce. Oh, I thought that was where you were heading no. about the cost of living. Got, I thought that was a good discussion to, to we start. Were, really. Thank you, Sean. We might take another break and then I want to talk about the anti terror laws. Some went through the Parliament this week, others were introduced to Parliament today. Stay with me. Have you ever thought about getting life insurance? Stop thinking about it. Go to the Alliance website, get yourself covered. Say you're 39, don't smoke, and you want $350,000 cover. Enough to pay off the mortgage? Less than $8 a week. Now just apply online without a medical. Easy. So if you've ever thought about life insurance, stop thinking about it. Go to allianz.com.au and get yourself covered in minutes. You'll be okay with Allianz. I just want to be okay today. Before you bet on the Victoria Derby, check out these bookies. Then visit luxbet.com because we beat their best price products on the Victoria Derby by 50% guaranteed. Switch to Luxbet and win 50% more on the Victoria Derby. Luxbet.com Mortgage Choice offers hundreds of home loans from up to 28 lenders and the expert advice to help you find the right one. So you'll be as happy as... Mortgage Choice. Know the feeling. Need to fix something properly? Well, now you can with Selly's Araldite. In fact, it's strong enough to hold up to 75 kilos. So don't just fix it, Araldite it. If it's Selly's, it works. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly. Pack up, let's fly away. It's Coles Interest Free Mastercard time. Right now, the Coles No Annual Fee Mastercard is offering 0% interest on all purchases for six months if you apply and are approved by December 31st. Six months interest free. And you'll pay no annual fee ever. Never, ever. That's an interest free six months. Oh, yeah, interest free. Apply for a Coles No Annual Fee Mastercard today at coles.com.au forward slash credit cards. Coles Mastercard. Your local health food store might be the last place you'd think of to ask about thinning hair and baldness. But with Fusion Health Hair Tonic and Hair, Skin and Nails, the traditions of ancient Chinese remedies come together with modern herbal medicine. Taken together, they are formulated with Phytofol, a herbal extract that works in synergy with other herbs, essential vitamins and minerals to nourish the scalp and regenerate hair follicles, promoting healthy regrowth and condition. Fusion Health, ancient wisdom, modern medicine. Start the week with a different viewpoint. Join me as we look at the crucial national issues from outside Canberra's politically correct part. There will be big interviews, lively debate. You say it's a contradiction, Chris. I don't accept that it is. Join me for Viewpoint on Sky News. I want to talk about some of the anti-terror laws that went through the Parliament this week and others that were introduced today. Mark Dreyfus, Shadow Attorney General. Should journalists be jailed for up to 10 years for reporting on a special intelligence operation? I think this has been overblown to an extent, David. I don't think any journalists are going to be jailed for 10 years. I don't think any journalists are going to be jailed. Uh, there is a secrecy provision applying to a very, very small, what will be a very small part of ASIO's work, uh, which are undercover operations to be known as special intelligence operations. Uh, we've noted the concerns that have been expressed uh, about that secrecy provision. Its purpose, of course, is to protect the lives potentially of ASIO officers and uh, in fact in my second reading in the second reading speech I did on that bill which was the first 
National Security Bill uh, passed some weeks back. Um, I noted the concern, said that we would keep it under, uh, we would monitor its operation, keep it under review. Those concerns have continued to be expressed and that's why Bill Shorten wrote to the Prime Minister yesterday asking for the independent National Security Legislation Monitor, who of course will have to be appointed, Still not appointed. Uh, because the government's left the position <coughs> vacant, uh, should be asked to have a look at the operation of that provision and whether there's some um, better way to um, make sure that the public interest is taken into account. Shouldn't the, you have done this before voting in favour of it? Uh, no. The Com Intelligence Committee and Labor members of the Intelligence Committee worked on this and made a recommendation that there should be set out in the explanatory memorandum uh, very clear direction to the Director of Public Prosecutions to take public interest into account in making any decisions on whether to prosecute. No, but what section. I'm getting to, you, you've now asked for the Inspector General of Intelligence um, sorry, the um, independent, independent national, national security national legislation. Security legislation monitor. Monitor. It's a mouthful. Yes. Uh, uh, to review this measure, but you didn't ask that before passing the bill. It's a response to the fact that concerns have continued to be expressed by journalists like yourself. And Lachlan Murdoch and, and your Lachlan own colleague Murdoch Anthony Albanese. And a whole range of people. And I think that the best way to deal with that is to have a review okay. by the person best placed when appointed. So when she or he is appointed, uh, that one of the tasks that the Prime Minister should give to the monitor is looking at this section. What do you think of the idea that the Attorney General announced today that if the Director of Public Prosecutions were to um, consider a prosecution of a journalist, the Attorney General of the day would have to approve it. It shows complete confusion on the part of this Attorney General who does not understand that the reason why uh, all states of Australia and the Commonwealth have legislated for a Director of Pro Public Prosecution since starting in Victoria in 1982 is to keep politicians away from the prosecution process and doubly so in this situation where we've got the Attorney General approving special intelligence operations and now also apparently to have some say in whether or not there are to be prosecutions for a breach of the secrecy around special intelligence operations. I can't think of anything that's more confused. Uh, we need to get politicians away from the prosecution process. Yeah, why should the Attorney General be the safeguard here in, in this example? Well, I think Mark's opening remarks is about right. The concern has been, in my view, grossly exaggerated. In fact, the Attorney-General today made it very clear that it's hard to imagine a scenario that would see a journalist at risk of prosecution. So why does he have to add this extra a layer very of... very uh... narrow um, thread of what our intelligence organisations are up to. What he also said was that the concern that's raised about the impact on full disclosure, frank journalistic reporting of the conduct of government would be viewed as a highly political, highly sensitive intervention and that's why the Attorney General would have to agree to proceed with such a prosecution and then carry and be accountable for the political consequences of that decision. So it's responding to the concern that these security measures may be used for some political motive, a, a concept that we reject, and that as a consequence a journalist may be at risk of prosecution, a concept we can't imagine how that would happen, but the safeguard being that would be viewed as a very political act, and that's why the Attorney General is in the frame, to be aware that the public accountability and the political accountability of such a course of action would rest with the government. Sean, do you think this whole fear is overblown? No, as both have put it. No, because we're not just talking. We're not just talking about the chilling effect uh, of on the particular journalist who might go to jail. We're talking about the chilling effect on journalism in general. And the whistleblowers and the and, and the whistleblowers. But in particular, journalists. I think once journalists are in the position in which a government can designate any mission it likes, a special mission, uh, then journalists suddenly have to tread very, very carefully, much more carefully than they otherwise would be. And I've been a press secretary uh, for a number of years, and um, you know, thankfully not anymore. And I've gone to a lot of fights with journalists over the years, you know, real shouting matches at times. But when it came to matters of national security, I have never run across a journalist who was not willing to be incredibly responsible. Uh, and I do not understand why uh, members of the government like Bruce are saying we cannot imagine a scenario in which a journalist would go to jail and then feeling a need to include a specific provi provision about journalists in the legislation. This is the thing, why not just remove exempt? It. Why not remove it? Why not just, ex if it's not going to happen, if you think it's impossible, remove it. 
Well, because it's not a provision targeted at journalists. I know so journalists just have an are very there. important. It mentions I know reporting. they're very important, but that's not the only I mean, thing not, that I'm goes being, on in our country. I know. I'm and not being that's precious why here. I'm saying this is an to... important thing that journalists, and it's not so much people like me, but investigative journalists who do uh, carry out you know, important yeah. works on this stuff, the chilling effect is considered to be a real threat. And this is why the Attorney General has said, given the concerns that have been raised as unimaginable mm. as the circumstances are that give rise to those concerns, here is a particular further safeguard to think deal with that segment of our community we all love and admire and don't wish to constrain. But as Mark said, there is some important very narrow stream of operations where people doing courageous work for our country shouldn't have to be concerned about being put at risk. Jim, do you think that extra safeguard announced today is worthwhile? Um, I don't think it is worthwhile. I would prefer to see um, subsequent oversight of these provisions. I mean, these are quite extraordinary, some of these laws. They are extraordinary. So I like to see oversight. I like sunset clauses. I think that's a great idea. Um, but I think it really comes back to what both Mark, um, what Mark said right at the beginning, and that is that it's a very narrow remit, this provision. It relates, for example, to um, an ASIO person who goes into a deep covert operation with ISIS. Now we don't want their cover blown because the first thing that will happen is that ISIS will kill them. We also don't want, once they come out from a deep covert operation, we don't want that blown because it tells ISIS about our covert capabilities. So it's not just about the life you know, mm. uh, uh, of the of the agent. But it's the also about our capabilities, yeah. and I think it does at the moment. Unfortunately, it calls for some extraordinary laws. But you know, that, uh, I think there's also a lot of hysteria. Take, for example, yesterday there was a report that um, journalists who reported on the recruitment of jihadists in Australia could be jailed. That was a complete and utter nonsense, right? Complete and utter nonsense misleading reporting from the media. Um, this is a provision that's been around since 1978. It relates to if you are taking a commission helping the recruitment mm. of jihadists, you will then have committed a crime. It's been there forever. A journalist has never, ever been prosecuted. I think we jump the gun too often. It's not often I'm on exactly <laughs> the same page as Janet, but I can say that Janet got that exactly right. There's been, there is a real need for some precision in reporting and examination of some of these provisions, and that particular one, which is about the bill, the Foreign Fighters Bill, which has just passed through the Parliament, it carries across some provisions from the Foreign Incursions Act, older provisions that have been there since 1978. Yeah. They prohibit advertisements being carried in Australian media for recruitment of people to go and fight in foreign Just conflicts. quickly, because we are nearly out of time, and this debate obviously has a long way to go, but metadata. The committee's going to look at it. You're going to sit on the committee that, uh, that looks at it, I understand, and you want to take until next year to reach a conclusion? Oh, definitely. We've told the government, and I believe the government's now accepted, that this can't possibly be considered by the parliament until into 2015. The, the extra detail you've seen on this today, what would and wouldn't be included, things like the contents of an email, subject line of an email, we're still waiting for this. Is a, this is, a, this is a, a kind of shell bill that's been produced, which leaves everything to regulations which have yet to be produced. Right. So, so you it's, still almost, to go it's, it's raised more on. questions than it's answered. The government's attempted to answer some questions, but this is a very difficult area, David. It's been under discussion since 2008. And uh, the government, again, tried, it brought it in in a rush, didn't consult with the opposition at all. Uh, happily, we've said to them very very directly, don't think about passing this this year, which seem to be hovering. Uh, it'll have to be passed sometime next year, if it's passed at all. And in the meantime, we need an adequate period for scrutiny and some much, much more detail needing to be produced by the government. As I say, I think there's a lot more debate to come on that metadata element. We are out of time tonight. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for your company as well. We'll be back same time next week. See you then. At AGL, we create energy solutions for every part of every day. Like helping businesses manage their energy with a dedicated business line available on extended hours. Call 133 835 to find out more.
We smelt bolognese. Yeah. Add Campbell's real stock to make it even tastier. Campbell's real stock, Australia's favourite stock, made from scratch. Before you bet on the Victoria Derby, check out these bookies. Then visit luxbet.com because we beat their best price products on the Victoria Derby by 50% guaranteed. Switch to Luxbet and win 50% more on the Victoria Derby. Luxbet.com. <laughs> Do you need some help? Hey. M&M's. Can't resist them. Because shopping is easier at your local IGA, you'll have more time for summer fun. You could win hot summer prizes and save half price on Uncle Toby's snack variety. That's the way I like it. Welcome to Progressive, where we're 100% online. What's that? We call it the bundler. Let's say you need insurance on a couple of cars. We put them together on one policy and you get a discount on both. Wow. Two in one. How'd you think of that? Just came to us. What? Visit progressiveonline.com.au to bundle your cars and save. business is about getting a new game plan. Learning from your mistakes can be challenging and expensive. So check out some do's and don'ts, even get inspired. Series 2 of Business Success on Sky News Business Channel 602. Mr Wyala Wipeout now wants to have a sensible discussion. Get set for petrol prices to rise. It's not a new tax, it's the indexation of an old one. With no mandate from the Australian people. Delivering unrivaled live coverage, this is Sky News, Australia's news channel. Welcome to Paul Murray Live. I'm obviously still not Paul Murray and he's still on holidays. He will be back. This is my last night and I'm looking forward to it very much tonight. The great regular Thursday night panel, so it'll seem just like normal except for the bloke with the beard. Now, before we get to it, and of course it was a big day. Privacy the issue, again. But today it was because the government suddenly put through that data retention bill we'd been hearing about. Of course, that's prompted a major outpouring in the media, a concern about privacy considerations, personal freedoms, what protections we have. They've assured us that it only covers certain areas. It won't go into your browsing history, the content, not your phone calls, and certainly not your emails, of course. What's in those? They're private. Well, that comes a day after... A leading politician had her emails, her private emails, splashed all across the front pages and against her will, as we find out today. Now, uh, apparently the justification for that is that it was in the public interest. So, obviously a slight difference there on what people class as privacy. I mean, in this day and age, as I always say, with Gen Y, the fact they vomit every personal detail to the internet and then wonder what's going to happen later. Well, you know, it's all out there. And yes, in case you're wondering, kiddies, your future employers will look at all those selfies, nude shots and drunken drinking shots everywhere. But if they're worried about privacy, yet it's okay to put private emails out in the media, it's obviously a debate we should be having. I always thought the argument was that the data retention was only a problem for those who were doing something wrong. They were the ones who should be worried. The rest of us need not worry. I was thinking, really, crimes like terrorism. I didn't think adultery was there yet. Now, let's go to the news headlines with Vanessa Grimm. 
Janine, thank you. Good evening to you. Hello, everyone. And internet browsing histories, as Janine mentioned, will not be collected by the government. After details of its new metadata retention laws were announced, the government has also ruled out tracking people using their mobile phone data. In new laws that will make phone and internet companies keep customer records for two years. But some MPs are still highlighting privacy concerns. The definition of metadata hasn't always been easy to explain. Well, I, the, my, 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 the, what you're viewing on the internet is not what we're interested in. Releasing the draft legislation, the Attorney General was back on message. A specific provision is made to exempt from the scope of the bill a person's web browsing history. Internet providers will keep records for two years, including who customers have emailed, but not the content. Phone companies will keep the numbers a person calls or texts, but no details. Information could be used to target terrorism, drug raids or child pornography. It simply ensures that data will continue to be available to agencies as part of legitimate investigations. The government concedes it will need to compensate companies for the cost of storing data for two years. And as for privacy concerns... Every call you take, every internet move you make, the government will be watching you. The legislation will be reviewed by the powerful Defence and Intelligence Committee. The government recognises that data retention raises genuine concerns about privacy. New laws will likely be broadly supported by the committee, albeit with some changes, as happened with the government's first two anti-terror legislation pieces. But the opposition leader is having second thoughts about the first of those anti-terror laws, which includes a provision to make it easier to lock up journalists for reporting on intelligence operations. Maybe we need to have a second look at this. And yet Labor voted the bills through a month ago. Tom Connell, Sky News, Canberra. Australia's intelligence service still doesn't know whether one of our most wanted terrorists has died in the Middle East. According to fellow jihadist Muhammad Ali Barillay was killed fighting with Islamic State. We've been checking those reports very carefully over the last 48 hours uh, and at this stage I'm still unable to confirm uh, whether he is alive or dead. A former King's Cross bouncer and Parramatta Street preacher was behind an alleged plot to behead members of the public in Sydney. Perth man Aaron Carlino has been sentenced to life in prison for the murder of an underworld figure whose severed head washed up on Rottnest Island. Carlino, who will be eligible.